Welcome to Why Public Service, a podcast of the R Street Institute, a free market think tank in Washington, D.C. I'm your host, Kevin Kosar. In each episode, I speak with an individual who made the choice to participate in governing our nation. Some of my guests have worked for the government. Others have toiled in various private sector organizations, including think tanks, philanthropies, and political groups. All of them share the same goal, however, which is to improve our country through public service. Today's guest is Andy Rotherham, co-founder and partner at Bellwether Education Partners, a national nonprofit organization working to support educational innovation and to improve outcomes for underserved students. Andy is a contributing editor to U.S. News and World Report and a senior editor at The 74, an education news and analysis publication. And he blogs at eduwonk.com. Andy previously worked in the White House and has started two other education organizations. You can learn more about Andy by visiting bellwethereducation.org. Andy, welcome to the Why Public Service podcast. Kevin, thank you for having me. As our listeners have heard, you are an entrepreneur in the education policy space. What led you to co-found Bellwether? What was the path that led you there? Sure. And it obviously wasn't just me. I had three, uh, three co-founders, three amazing people. Uh, Mary Wells, who's still at Bellwether. She's our managing partner. Kim Smith, who was at Bellwether for a while, was our, was our first uh, CEO slash managing partner, but then uh, has, has spun out her own initiative and led that for a while. And Manisha Lozier, who likewise, a few years later, spun out an initiative. Uh, and so it was four of us. And the problem we were basically trying to solve is This was the latter part of the last decade, and what was happening is education reformers were still very much talking about themselves in this outside frame that they were the insurgents and all that, but if you looked, they were increasingly being appointed to leadership roles in states. Uh, Arne Duncan was becoming Secretary of Education. It seemed harder to, to claim that this was an insurgent outside movement, and in fact, it was a movement that needed to be accountable for results, and we, we collectively, we took a look at different areas where we felt there was work to be done there and we were coming up short and concluded that there was an organization, a nonprofit mission-driven kind of consulting firm to be built to address those. And that was particularly capacity execution. So a lot of the work we do around sort of strategy and planning and that kind of work and implementation. And then also around sort of both policy analysis, policy development and ideas and so forth. And that there was a lot of work to be done uh, there as well. And those are the two things that the organization has blended, which makes us a little bit unique that we do both of those in the, in the way that we uh, do. You don't see a lot of other folks doing that. But that was the problem we set out to solve. That was to, um, now formally, uh, we've been in business for 10 years and have, have obviously learned a lot, but we still see those problems as, as pretty acute ones. For listeners who are new to the education policy innovation space, can you clarify, who are the customers of Bellwether? generally speaking? Is it foundations? Is it individual schools? Or is it someone else? Since we're a nonprofit and we're mission-driven, there's sort of two. There's our clients and then our impact. We, we view the ultimate customers' clients are kids, and our, our entire mission statement is around we want to see dramatic change for historically underserved populations. That is particularly, obviously, in this country, as anyone who understands the history of this country knows, Racial and ethnic minorities have been particularly ill-served by public schools, but also low-income kids, special ed kids. So kids who have historically been marginalized by public schools, that is that all of our projects we, we take on through a lens of what is the impact going to be there. The clients that we work with to achieve that, we work with uh, a range, and we're a little different. You know, a lot of firms focus, so they, they work on like early stage stuff or large, they have like a large public sector practice or whatever. We pick our clients more and and they pick us based on sort of two dimensions. One, that impact piece I just talked about. And then also um, sort of is it a new impact driven sort of, I hate to say entrepreneurial because that has like a private sector connotation, but new creative, innovative, entrepreneurial way of, of trying to solve problems. And so that leads us. We work with school districts. We work with charter schools. We work with foundations. Um, we work with local uh, organizations that are philanthropically dependent We do a little bit of private sector work. We work with a lot of large national nonprofits. And that mix of clients we think is interesting because it helps us learn uh, more and have a broader field of view, creates some variety and diversity in the work, uh, and allows us to have impact in more places. And so, like, you know, it's unusual that we can work with sort of media outlets and so forth. And we also work with school districts. It gives us, we think, uh, interesting reach and perspective. 
As a co-founder and partner at Bellwether, what are your specific responsibilities and what does your average day look like? All right, those are two different questions. And over the years, my responsibilities have obviously evolved. So now sort of some general sort of leadership, big picture stuff, um, day-to-day, I'm very involved in our external communications work, which is a place traditionally, we haven't actually put a lot of attention on that. um, And we want to become much more intentional about that. Per what I was saying earlier, our strategy folks are out in the field, our analysts are out in the field learning you know, a little less out in the field right now during COVID, but in general, in and out of schools a lot, our evaluation work, we're learning a lot of different things and we want to um, be much more intentional about translating that and so forth. And traditionally, we've been very driven, the projects are what motivate us and, and we haven't really paid a lot of, a great deal of attention to that and we want to uh, work on that. So I'm spending a lot of time uh, on, on that and leading that part of our work right now. And then I also do a lot of work on our, our policy uh, an evaluation team, both sort of working on projects uh, and then also helping sort of sell and, and find uh, find projects for us. There really isn't a typical day, and obviously, you know, nothing is typical right now in the COVID period, but I guess I would say to the extent there is, one of the great parts about our work is you're, you're, you're learning a lot. I think the kind of people who both enjoy and succeed at our work are sort of broad-minded people who like to learn about things and are, are sort of naturally curious um, and sort of naturally empirical in terms of how they approach the world. So I spend a lot of time, uh, the early parts of my day, I try to hold back a lot of time for reading and writing and, 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 and sort of I would describe as sort of general learning and that's both sort of topical things that are happening and, and deeper things. And then as the day goes on, I tend to get sucked in. There's, that's where more of my meetings get scheduled. In the old days, uh, I used to sometimes, you know, you'd be able to meet a colleague for lunch and kick stuff around. I used to meet you for lunch. Obviously, that's not something that's happening so much anymore outside of Zoom. And then more meetings and so forth throughout the afternoon. In a nor- normal time, there's a fair amount of travel. And so you are out meeting with people. You're on site. I mean, one of the really cool things about our work is you get to be in and out of a lot of schools. And, you know, we, we tend to talk about schools a lot in this country in the singular, but, you know, there's 100,000 of them. They're all over the country and they're very different. And that's a real awesome part of our work. Um, but that is obviously, you know, since March, we haven't been doing, obviously, uh, any of that. And so those meetings during the afternoon are both on sort of that biz gen, uh, talking with people about different things and, and what we do, and then also working and advising on the projects that we're, that we're currently working on. So I guess uh, part of the day is solo, part of the day is meetings. So if you're, if you're sort of in, in the line between introvert and introvert, it's probably perfect. Our introverts might find like parts of the day kind of exhausting and our extroverts you know, this kind of work, as you know, a lot of what we do, policy work, this kind of thing, a lot of it's actually kind of solo work that you do in isolation. And that's obviously not for everybody either. You've been in the public sphere in one position or other since the 1990s. What lessons have you learned in that time about governance, about affecting change in society? Oh, man, so many. And so many, I mean, I think so many things that that you, you change your views on, your views evolve. I guess if a couple of sort of things that have been very influential in my thinking. Uh, Jonathan Rausch, he's in the news a lot right now because he, he does a lot of work on sort of free speech and free expression and so forth. Um, that's obviously a, a, a topic right now that, that's getting a lot of attention. But he wrote a book called Demisclerosis that's about sort of special interest in Washington. And I think that book was, it wasn't specifically about education, but that book was sort of hugely influential in sort of understanding the policy ecosystem that exists in Washington to a lesser but very real extent out in the States. And a guy named Eric Potashnik, he's a professor at UVA, he's actually one of my professors a long time ago uh, in grad school. He, Eric, wrote about sort of when the special interests prevail, or excuse me, when the general interest prevails, which was basically about how, you know, in general in American life, special interests wield a great deal of sort of concentrated influence and the general interest wins out sort of sometimes, and you see that in sort of broad general interest reforms, but in general, special interests are able to work their will, and that's just how things work in a, in a governmental system our way. So like both of those books were influential for me when, when I first, uh, and, and those ideas when I first encountered them, and then just sort of throughout the course of, of my work. Second, I spend a lot of time thinking about incentives. I mean, I have sort of a very sort of basic view of the world on this that, you know, essentially humans do respond to incentives. We're all humans and therefore incentives matter to, to some extent in policy. And I think we, especially in education, people can sort of assume that some of the normal 
things that that apply uh, in the world and in policymaking somehow don't apply here, and that gets us in a lot of, of trouble. Third, the role of choice. My views on that have sort of evolved, and that's also sort of 20 years of, of ed reform battles. Choice itself is a form of accountability, and, and we, we need to think creatively about how we deploy it and, and empowering citizens. I mean, I, the work I do, I do in general to give people choices in their lives, but I'm speaking in a governmental context in terms of just choices, uh, giving people choices inside various kinds of policy arrangements seems an undervalued uh, an undervalued mechanism. Uh, and then finally, like a big lesson that I've just been struck by, you know, there's always a disconnect between policy and sort of politics and rhetoric. And I mean, at least as long when I say always, at least like, you know, since I've been doing this work since the, since the 1990s, I was at the White House uh, under President Clinton in 99 and 2000. And that was obviously an interesting time. So, so with that perspective, and then the odds, there's always been a gap but I've seen it over the last 25 years grow, this gap between sort of what's actually happening in the policymaking process, what's the policy about, what, it's, what is it intended to do, what is it doing, and how it's sort of talked about, uh, the larger atmospherics. And that has really accelerated in the age of social media. And so just for example, you know, you and I are talking, you know, in the middle of August. So just yesterday, there was a federal court ruling around um, the Title IX sexual assault guidelines that the um, uh, Trump administration just issued uh, earlier this year. And I look at sort of the way that issue is debated uh, on sort of social media and so forth, and then the actual ins and outs of a fair number of court cases and legal processes, and the gap is just enormous. And you see that on a range of issues. I mean, we saw that on No Child Left Behind, obviously, but it's like grown on a range of things. And I think that is actually impacting governance in some ways that we don't maybe fully understand or appreciate what is actually happening and what people who are charged and accountable for governance. And, and so that's like staff and elected officials and all that, what they're doing and trying to do versus like this larger sort of noise and debate around it. If, if that gap is growing, and it seems to me it is, there seems, there, I think there's some real consequences there politically and, and just in terms of our, of our democracy. And so that's a that's I, I, that last one's not a lesson I've learned, but more like a trend that I am, I am watching and trying to figure out. What's the toughest part about your current job? Uh, besides that I'm like stuck in my home office and I can't go, go anywhere. Um, so to more generally, if, if, if you're speaking more generally other than COVID, I think sort of mechanically, things like balancing multiple priorities, sort of constant need to be learning and trying to be reflective against the press of, of business and, and operations and all of that. So mechanically, it's all of those kinds of, of things. I guess sort of more spiritually larger, you know, policy issues come and go. I've been doing education work long enough now that I've, I've seen us twice sort of people are trying to really radically change how we deliver schooling and focus on equity in this country. I've, I've seen now sort of two boom and bust cycles from when we were darlings to villains and back to being darlings and back to being villains. You have to sort of take the long view, but that can be, you know, at, at, at times it's easy to be philosophical about that. At other times it's extremely frustrating, especially given sort of the urgency and the importance of this work. If, you know, Anyone who's listening, who's, who's thinking about getting into education should sort of familiarize themselves to some extent with just the general education data of this country to just appreciate just these seismic um, gaps in achievement that we uh, tolerate between different racial, ethnic, income, socioeconomic groups of students that persist over time uh, and how those are just linked to sort of broader opportunity gaps uh, in America. Like it can, it, it can you know... I, so I teach part time and I like doing that because your impact is very tangible and real. You can see with students the work you're doing. If you work in sort of policy and you do these things, you, you do see impact and, and you, you can point to, to things and that's very satisfying. Um, and often it can be fairly consequential things, but boy, it is long. The, 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 um, the period between those and everything else that goes on, it is long. And so it, it requires a degree of, of, of sort of patience and a real North Star that uh, is it, that, that I think for most people can be testing it at, at various uh, and trying at various uh, at various points. I think that is the toughest part. And you know, the great thing about American democracy is American democracy. It is messy and complicated and factionalized. It's been all those you know. It, it, it's been that way since you know 
Madison and Hamilton, you know, and Jay were writing about it. Um, that is also the frustrating thing about it. It can be very hard to get things done, even as I was saying on that earlier point on sort of the general interest and special interest. It can be very hard to get things done, even when sort of the answer is, is, is relatively obvious uh, or widely supported. Um, and that, that can be, that's a, that's a frustrating thing you have to make your peace with if you uh, intend to do this kind of work. So that leads me nicely to my final question. The work you do is not easy. There's not a quick payoff. Success is often hard to achieve. You could have chosen another career path. So why public service? Yeah, I mean, I have sort of a very personal answer on it, but also just in general, I feel like um, one of the best things you can do is simply try to make life better for others. And there are many, many ways to do that. I take a fairly broad sense of, of what is public service. And then I also think people just in other sectors, entrepreneurs who are building products and things and, you know, different, different things, you know, in, in, in medicine and biotech, there's lots of different things, but like trying to make the world a better place for others strikes me as sort of a, a fairly, uh, at least for me, it's a fairly sort of central value. And so that's, um, that's why. And, and I, I think if you look at education and you reflect on your own experiences and so forth, I mean, I didn't grow up super wealthy. I didn't go to private schools, anything like that. My, you know, my mom was a private school teacher. My dad worked for the government, but we were, we were comfortable. I didn't worry about where my next meal was coming from. That's just a function of zip code, right? And so I was able to go to decent, decent public schools. And it strikes me that if you sort of believe in sort of some idea of sort of that this country needs to be about equality of opportunity and that people have a, a chance to grasp for, for, for the various rings and so forth that they want to, um, and move up the ladder, we simply cannot tolerate this, these incredible inequities. And if you just look at the data in terms of people who are born into poverty, and if they don't uh, get a quality education, uh, the likelihood that they'll live their lives in poverty versus uh, there's, you know, some chance at social mobility and so forth. It's just, it's just an issue that I think, like, it is not the everything would be, you know, would be better, but it strikes me as it's extremely, uh, it's not sufficient, but it's extremely necessary. Andy, thank you for your efforts. And thank you for joining me on the podcast. Kevin, thank you for having me. I hope it's helpful to somebody who's thinking about going into this line of work. Thank you for listening to Why Public Service, a podcast of the R Street Institute. Please subscribe to the podcast and share it with your friends. Even better, rate and review us on iTunes so we can reach more listeners. Tell us what you thought about it and who we should interview next by finding us on Twitter at RSI. If you want to know more about R Street, sign up for our newsletters at www.rstreet.org. I'm your host, Kevin Kosar. Thank you to producer William Gray and editor Parker Tant from parkerpodcasting.com.